Today we're going to start a new series of, of messages for the next several weeks. We're going to be dealing with, with this issue, healing the spirit. Healing the spirit. As a matter of fact, just say that out loud. Say healing the spirit. Now, w- the reason why we're going to be talking about this is because several weeks ago, um, the Lord impressed a, a verse on Pastor Vasquez's heart, our senior pastor. The Lord impressed a verse on, on his heart. Uh, and he came and he shared it with the congregation, came and shared it with us as, as a staff, came and shared it with me personally. And we believe with all of our heart that this is what God is speaking um, for this moment right now. We don't always know, right? We can't, we can't always say what, what God is going to speak in, in a month from now or what God is going to say in a year from now. But we have the responsibility of hearing what God is saying now, what God is speaking now now and we believe with all of our hearts that that from this verse uh, God has spoken what he wants to to speak to the lives of his people but more importantly than that what God wants to do in the lives of his people you know there's a there's a scripture um, that I came across just yesterday and I and I it was so powerful I had to post it um, on, on Facebook but it says that it came a point in Israel's history that God fulfilled every single one of his promises. And this verse in Joshua, it says that not one of his promises went unfulfilled. He fulfilled every single one of those. I say that today because by me declaring, by us declaring what God is speaking, I also want you to know that when God says something, he has every intention of fulfilling and doing what he says. God is not in the business of just, pardon the expression, Lord, I guess, but He's not in the business of just blowing out a lot of hot air like some people are. Some people are full of hot air. If you, if you know some people that are full of hot air, just say a hearty amen to that. Okay. Because there are some people that will just talk and they will speak and they will say things, but never really back it up, never really come through. They, they make a lot of promises, but they never really fulfill their promises. God is not in, in, in that way at all. Matter of fact, the scripture says that God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. In other words, he cannot change his mind. When he says something, when he declares something, he will do it. And if God is speaking today that he wants to come upon the lives of his people, of his children, and begin to heal spirits, then I have all the confidence in the world that what we're going to be experiencing in the next several weeks is God healing the spirit of his people. God healing the spirit of men and of of women, spirits that have been injured, spirits that have been wounded, spirits that have been hurt, spirits that have been neglected god is going to come on the scene of your life he is going to intervene with his power with his love with his strength with his anointing and he's going to bring healing to the spirit of his people proverbs chapter 18 and verse 14 this is what the scripture says a man's spirit sustains him in sickness but a crushed spirit who can bear let me repeat that A man's spirit sustains him in sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear. In other words, the Bible is saying that your physical body, your human body, the the physical part of you can be sick. It can be injured. It can be wounded. It can be diseased. It can be sick. But if your spirit is healthy and if your spirit is intact, then it will sustain you. Okay. In other words, have you ever gone, this happens to me very, very often, right? As a, as a pastor, we'll go to somebody's home, we'll go to a hospital to go visit somebody. Uh, it happened to me two times very recently. Uh, one, I went to go visit a dear sister from our church, Sister Diana Gonzalez. Um, she has been receiving some very, very bad reports from the doctor this week. She received a very negative report from, from the doctor. I went to go visit with her. And, and, and in my mind, I'm saying, man, I'm, I want to go be an encouragement to her. I want to go be, you know, somebody that will lift her spirits. I want to pray for her. I want to intercede for her. I want to encourage her. And, and yet, when I leave that, when I left her house, I think I was more encouraged by her than she was by me. Why? Because her physical body is sick, but her spirit is strong and it's healthy. And it is sustaining her. She has a beautiful ad- attitude right now. She has a wonderful outlook on life, even though she's receiving all these neg- negative reports. Another one was a, a couple of weeks ago, I went to go visit Pastor Nick, 
in, in, in the hospital, in this Nick Camacho. And, in, and again, there were some bad reports, there were some bad things coming along that they were receiving, that he was receiving from the doctors and from the physicians. And I go in there thinking, man, I want to I encourage him, I want to pray for him, I want to lift his spirits. And, and on the contrary, he's there cracking jokes and just trusting in the Lord, and his faith was strong even though his body may be weakened right now. This is what the scripture is saying. A man's spirit sustains him in sickness. Your human body, your physical part of you can be sick, but when your spirit is strong, I mean, it'll sustain you. It'll strengthen every, every fiber of your being. But look at the second part of the verse. But a crushed spirit, who can bear? In other words, but what happens when the spirit is not strong? What happens when the spirit of a person is not healthy? What happens when the spirit of a person is wounded or it's sick or it's, 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 it's gone through some things that has left it debilitated? What happens then? And church, I, I, I want to ask you a question. What happens to us when our spirit becomes traumatized, when our spirit becomes wounded, when our spirit becomes weak? Because let me tell you something. I know you're a man of God. I believe that you're a woman of God. But the last time that I checked, you were still wrapped in flesh. And we go through things. We go through experiences. We have to go through life. And sometimes the disappointments or the tragedies or the crisis or the experiences of life leave our spirit damaged. You see, the greatest problem is not that, that you would have a, a disease or a sickness or something wrong with you physically or even mentally. What's more debilitating and what's more damaging is when your spirit has been wounded. And so the question arises... What do we do in that case? What, what, where are we to go? Because look, if you had a problem with your teeth, you'd go to the dentist. If you had a problem with your heart, you'd go to the cardiologist. If you had a problem with your feet, you'd go to the podiatrist. If you had a problem with your brain, you'd go to the psychiatrist or you'd go to a, neuro, a, a neurologist. But where do you go when your spirit has been wounded? Where do you go when your spirit is sick? Where do you go when the experiences of life have depleted, not from your physical being, from, but your, from what, your, your spiritual being? And for that, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61, beginning with verse number 1. Where do we go? Where does a person go? When their spirit, when their heart, when their inner being is broken and wounded. Isaiah 61 is, is a powerful, powerful passage of Scripture. The prophet Isaiah speaks these words or writes these words, but years later, Jesus goes into a synagogue and he gets up in front of the people that were gathered there. The Bible says that he opened the scroll of the prophet Isaiah to this specific portion of scripture and Jesus read what we're about to read he closes the scroll and he declares to the entire assembly there today these words have been fulfilled right before you in other words what we are about to read right now even though it was written by the prophet Isaiah and it was written about 800 years before Jesus lived here on earth it is describing the Lord Jesus himself Beginning with verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me. Everybody say anointed. It says that the, the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness from the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the great day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. And a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness. A planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. They will rebuild ancient ruins and restore the places that have been long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. You see, it was at this point that the Lord 
rolled up the, the scroll and he declared, today these words have been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, he was saying, the one that Isaiah was referring to, the one that Isaiah was talking about is standing right before you today. Now let me tell you something. Isaiah was referring to something and he was referring to someone. He was referring to Jesus Christ. And if you look at the name of Christ, it literally means this, anointed one. When we say Jesus Christ, we're not calling him by his first and last name, like you would say Robert Flores. He's not Jesus Christ because Christ is his last name. Christ is his title. His official title is Christ, meaning he is the anointed one of God. He is the one that God declared, that God prophesied that would come and that the fullness of the anointing of God would be resting upon him. And I'm here to tell you today that the same Jesus Christ, the anointed one of God, is here today to bring healing upon the spirit and the hearts of his people. He is the anointed one. And if you look at this, look what it says in, in verse 1 again. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. That's awesome. That the Spirit of God, the very Spirit of the Lord, the very essence of God would be on him. Because the Lord, he says, has anointed me. And for what purpose? He says to preach the good news to the poor. And I want you to understand here, it's not just talking about those that are poor in resources, those that are poor in finances. But more specifically, he's referring to those that are poor in spirit. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? To be poor in spirit is that you have gone through something that has depleted you spiritually. You have gone through something that has emptied you spiritually. It has discouraged you spiritually. Let me tell you something. There are different levels of discouragement. You can be discouraged in your mind. You can be discouraged in your emotions. But let me tell you something. It's a different thing when you are discouraged in your spirit. There are different levels of discouragement. Now, perhaps some of you, some of us, have never experienced the level of discouragement where it taps into your spirit, where your very spirit is depleted. But let me tell you something. There are some people that have gone through things, they've experienced things that has left their very spirit depleted. And they are poor in spirit. It says he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Let me tell you something. There is nothing that will break the heart more than something that is broken. A broken relationship, a broken dream, a broken ambition. That will break the heart of a person. He says to proclaim freedom for captives. And a captive is not only somebody who might be chained physically. Someone who might be bound physically. But there are people, and, and, and listen, I, I'm saying this because we need to confront the issues that are at hand so that we can allow God to do his work. But there are people even in the church that are captive to fear. There are individuals in the church that are captive to fear. I know people, believers who love the Lord, but they are so fearful that they will not walk out of their house or they will not drive a vehicle or they will not do certain things. They will not leave at certain times of the day. Why? Because there is a spirit of fear. I know Christians that won't even turn off the lights in their own home because they're captive to fear. I know individuals that have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, but they will not allow themselves to get close to people. They will not allow themselves to build bonds and to build relationships and to build friendships with people because they've been burned before and everything in their mind tells them you don't get close to people because they will just burn you again. Let me tell you something. You're a captive to fear. There are some people that are captives to addiction, to sinful habits, but look what the Spirit says, to proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkness for the prisoners. You don't have to be imprisoned to addiction. You don't have to be imprisoned to sinful habits. There is someone and there is something that can break the addictions, that can break the habits, and that is Jesus Christ himself, the anointed one. The anointed one. It says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Those who mourn. You know, a spirit can be damaged deeply, wounded deeply, when you have lost someone that you love so dearly. And it leaves a person depleted spiritually. 
You wouldn't think so because we think it's a mental thing. We think it's an emotional thing. No, sometimes you've loved somebody so much, and when that life is ripped from you, it is taken from you. And listen, God has a will that we don't understand sometimes. And sometimes God chooses to take people from our lives. Sometimes God chooses chooses to, to collect them and to receive them unto himself. But we love them, and we're human. And when we mourn sometimes, that mourning touches the very deepest part of who you are, and it can leave your spirit depleted. Well, let me tell you something. God does not want you to go the rest of your life mourning and in sorrow and in pain. His anointing is here to bring healing to the heart and to the spirit, to provide for those who grieve, to give us beauty instead of ashes. And I love this one, to give us a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Another version says of heaviness. I know I've talked to people sometimes, I'm sure you have, and maybe we've even felt that way before, that you see something in their, in their eyes, you see something in their face, something in their countenance, and you know something is wrong, and you go up to the individual, and you say, hey, are, are you okay? What's happening? And they can't even explain to you what's going on in them. They can't even tell you. They can't even communicate. They can't even articulate what they feel or why this, they feel this way. Listen, the Bible says that that is a spirit of heaviness but it is the anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ that lifts off a spirit of heaviness and it'll put on you a garment of praise. God wants to heal the spirit of his people. And look at what verse number four says, because when the anointing of of, of Jesus comes upon the life of an individual to do this, look at what verse four says, then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore places that have been long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. You see, we cannot move forward. We cannot advance. We cannot build. We cannot triumph. We can't really live in victory until the spirit of a man has been healed by God. It's the anointing. Now, that leaves the question, well, what is the anointing? If Jesus is the anointed one, then what is the anointing? Listen, the anointing, let let me put it to you this way. The anointing is when divine power touches human weakness. Let me repeat that. Anointing is when divine power touches human weakness. You see, none of us are here to say, hey, be strong in yourself. Hey, shape up. Hey, get your mind in order. Hey, get your spirit in order. None of us can come and heal our own spirit. None of us can come and do and, 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 and reach down into the deepest resources of our own selves to bring healing to ourselves. It requires something and someone above us and greater than us and far more advanced than us. And that's what the anointing is. The anointing is when divine power comes upon human weakness, when an individual will say, Lord, I have been broken. Lord, I have been ruined. Lord, I have been devastated. Lord, I have been poor in spirit, but I come to you. And in that moment, when we come to the Lord in faith, His divine power touches our human weakness and it comes and it makes a chemical reaction that is called the anointing. The anointing is the very power. It's the very essence of God. It is an unlimited divine power upon a human weakling like me. That's the anointing. And that is the thing, the only thing that will bring healing to the spirit of a man, to the spirit of a a woman that has been wounded. And, And... And listen, there are no substitutes. There are no substitutes for the anointing. If if the anointing is what brings about the healing of a spirit, then there is nothing else that will work. There is nothing else that will do the trick. There are no substitutes for the anointing. Look, there are some things in life, and I'm just here to tell you, there are some things in life where there are no substitutes, okay? Like, for instance, when when your gas tank on your car, the needle says it's on E. And you're on a trip because you've been saying, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll fill up in the next town. I'll fill up in the next town. And the next town never came. How many of you have been there before? I know there's a lot more of you. You're lying in the house of God. Hey, when you're in that situation, there are no substitutes. You need fuel. You need gasoline. You cannot pour big red in there. Trust me. There are no substitutes. The only thing that's going to get you moving again is to put fuel in the tank. There are no substitutes. There are some things in life where there are no substitutes. Like men, 
when your wife tries on a dress and she comes and she asks you, does this make me look fat? There are no substitutes for that answer. There are no substitutes. You better say, no. And you better say it the way that I just said it, no. Because if you say, I don't know, she don't hear, I don't know. She will hear you absolutely look fat like a hippo. She'll hear that. There are no substitutes. You can't, you can't even say, look, you can't even say, well, well, maybe just a little bit. You can't say that because you'll be in the doghouse. There are no substitutes. When your wife comes and asks you, does this dress make me look fat? You cannot even say, well, maybe from the hips a little bit. You can't say that. The only answer for that question is for you to get like an angry look on your face that she even had the gall to ask you that. And you say, no. There are no substitutes for that. I've been married long enough to know there are no substitutes for that. In church, in the same way, there are no substitutes for the anointing of God. There's nothing else that will lift the spirit of heaviness. There's nothing else that will soothe the wounded spirit. There's nothing else that will, that will comfort a grieving heart. There's nothing else that can pull you out of deep despair and sorrow and mourning. There's nothing else. It's only the anointing. There are no substitutes. And throughout, throughout history, God has been introducing us to his anointing through people. Because God has selected vessels throughout the course of human history. God has selected vessels. God has selected people that he chose and he specified that these would be the individuals, these would be the people that he would place his anointing on. In the book of Exodus, chapter 28, verse 41, you don't have to go there, but if you can write it down to, to look at it later, it speaks of how Aaron and his sons were to be anointed as priests. Exodus 28, 41 says, after you put these clothes on your brother Aaron and his sons, anoint, he says, and ordain them, consecrate them, so that they may serve me as priests. Exodus 29, 7 said, Take the anointing oil and anoint him by pouring it on his head. You see, oil has always been symbolic of the anointing of God. Oil has always meant, it has been a symbol of God's anointing when his spirit and his power comes upon an individual. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 13, we read about how the prophet Samuel was instructed to anoint David as king of Israel. Verse 13 says, so Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. And then Samuel went on to Ramah. Listen, you have to understand that when the Spirit, when the anointing comes upon you, from that moment forth, the power of the Lord is present. He is upon you. He is among you. He was within you. And he is working through you. What this world needs today, church, listen to me, what this world needs today is not more fancy preaching. What this world needs today is not worship teams that think they are rock stars. What this world needs today is not congregations that think coming to church is just something that we fulfill a religious obligation for the week. What this world needs today is more of the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God, the anointing, the very power of God that can bring freedom and liberation to the hearts and to the souls of people. It's the anointing because there are no substitutes. We see that the anointing was upon these people. We see that the anointing was upon these individuals. We see that the anointing was upon Jesus. But I want everyone to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. Look at this. The Apostle Paul writing to the Christians, to the believers. He's writing to the church. Did the anointing set that off, brother? Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. The Apostle Paul writing to the church. And I want you to understand he's writing to the church, to the people of God, to the collective people of God. That is the church. I myself am not a, am, am not a church. I myself am not the church. But when I come together with you, we are the church. The church is not the building. The church is not the brick, the mortar. The church is not the sheetrock. The church is not the roof. The church is the collective people of God coming together. We are the church. 
Paul is writing to the collective people of God, the church. And look at what he says. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 21. Now it is God. It is who? It is God who makes both us and you. Okay? Us and you is the church. It is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. And look at this. He anointed us. He anointed us. Set his seal of ownership on us. Put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. You see, the church of Jesus Christ, all of us collectively coming together, we have been brought together by strategy and by purpose of God. You are not here by coincidence. I am not here by coincidence. But we have been assembled through the strategy and through the wisdom and through the sovereignty of God. And when we come together, God says, that is where I will pour my anointing. That is where I will place my anointing. That is who I will put my spirit upon, upon the church of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the same thing that Jesus, the same reason why Jesus was sent here on the earth and the purposes that he had to fulfill have now become our purpose and our reason for existing. The very reason why the church of Jesus Christ walks upon the face of planet earth today is because God has anointed us, his church, to preach good news to the poor. God has anointed us to bind up the brokenhearted. God has anointed us the church of Jesus Christ to bind up their wounds God has anointed us to comfort them in their mourning God has anointed us to place upon them a spirit of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness God has anointed us his church his church we are anointed turn to two three your people around you and tell them we're anointed we're anointed we're anointed you see, God selects his people. God selects his vessels to carry his anointing. God selected you. God called you. God selected you. He placed you apart. He set you aside to put his anointing inside of you. And in any other, in any other situation, that's called an investment. When God takes of himself and of what is his and he puts it inside of you to say, hey, now you go forth and you do what I did, that's called an investment. God wants a return for his investment. He's invested his anointing inside of us. God selects his vessels. God selects his people to not only carry his anointing. Because look, 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 I want you to understand this. God selects his people, his church, not only to carry his anointing. And I thank the Lord, church, listen to me, I thank the Lord because God is faithful to his word. Because we are the church of Jesus Christ, because we are the collective body of Christ, the gathering of his people, he has already placed his anointing upon us. If you believe that, say amen. Because God is faithful to his word. But let me tell you something. God didn't call us to only be carriers of his anointing. He called us to be ministers of his anointing distributors of his anointing it's one thing to carry the blessing it's another thing to distribute the blessing and let me tell you something because God is faithful to his word the church of Jesus Christ has always been anointed and it will always be anointed but it is up to the church himself it is up to the people themselves to choose whether they will just be containers of the anointing or they will be ministers, servers, distributors of the anointing. And I'm here to tell you today, God does not want Bethesda to just be a carrier of the anointing, but God wants Bethesda to be distributors of his anointing, to be servers of his anointing. And that's up to us. Because the Spirit of the Lord is upon us. You see, when I think about ministering the anointing, when I think about serving and distributing the anointing, I cannot help but think about, you know where I'm going, right? I can't help but think about Fogo de Chao, Texas Day Brazil, Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. Because when you walk into those places, let me tell you something. When you walk into those places, this is exactly what you will see. And I want you to use your imagination for me for just a second. I want you to imagine 
that you have been on a long journey. I want you to imagine that you're famished, you're hungry, you're starving, you're thirsty. I want you to imagine that you've been traveling for so long, you've been journeying for so long, and it was hot, and the road was tiring. And you're at a point right now where you are exhausted, you are depleted. And you enter into one of these restaurants that I just mentioned, or the one of your choice, your favorite one. And as you walk through the door, you know how you feel. You know how you feel. You know how tired you feel. You know how depleted you feel. You know how hungry you feel. You know how thirsty you feel. And you've been journeying and you've been on this long journey. And you finally walk through the doors of, 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 that, of that building. And all of a sudden, you know like on a hot day in August in San Antonio. And you've been walking the streets. And you finally just go into an air-conditioned room. That thing just hits you like, And you feel that. You feel the air conditioner. You feel, and, and, and you walk in, and the person right at the door is like this. Welcome. And you're tired, and you're hungry, and you're thirsty, and you're just saying, give me a chair. Give me a seat. I need, I need something to drink. I need something to eat. I'm starving. And they lead you, and they pull out the seat, and you sit down, and they accommodate you. And they come, and they say, what can I bring you? And after you've looked at the menu, you make your order, you place your, your meal order. You say, I don't even have time to, to just, just give me my drink and give me my food all at once. I don't want you to come in stages. Bring it all. And you tell them exactly what you want. You tell them the beverage. You tell them the drink because you need something refreshing. You tell them the food because you need something to fill your stomach. And they go and they take your order. They write it down and they leave for a few moments. And then when they, when they come back, because you're looking everywhere, because uh, two minutes seems like an eternity for you at that point, right? And, 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 and you're waiting there, and, you're, and if you're like me, your knees go like this when you're really hungry and you're really thirsty, and you're looking all around, and then all of a sudden, you see somebody coming out like this. And you're thinking, man, there comes my T-bone. <sighs> Cooked medium just the way I like it. There comes my fully loaded baked potato. There comes my refreshing drink. There it comes. There it comes. There comes my green beans or my asparagus or whatever it is. There comes my salad. There comes whatever it is, my lobster bisque soup. There it comes. And he comes and he says, sir, your meal is served. And he takes it off and the plate is empty. There's nothing there. And then they say, now here's your check. You can pay it on your way out. Let me show you what that looks like. Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 21. This is God speaking through his prophet. This is God speaking through his servant. Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 21. Look at this. Since my people are crushed, I am crushed. I mourn, and horror grips me. Look at what Jeremiah says. Because I believe these were the sentiments of God through his mouth. Is there no balm in Gilead? My people are hurting. My people are wounded. My people are crushed, and because they're crushed, I'm crushed. Because they're hurting, I'm hurting. And he asks the question, is there no balm? In other words, is there no healing ointment? Is there no anointing? Is there no healing in Gilead? He says, is there no physician there? Why then is there no healing for the wound of my people? Let me tell you something. We are the church of Jesus Christ. But God forbid that there would be people coming through the doors of this church that have been on a long, hard journey. And they come wounded. They come hurting. They come tired. They come hungry. They come thirsty. And they get here. And the air condition is full blast. And it feels good. And the music sounds nice. And the preaching is entertaining. But when they really need is the anointing of God and when they come looking for the anointing far be it from us that they don't find the anointing far be it from us that God would have to say is there no balm in Bethesda is there none of my anointing in Bethesda 
Is it just a collective gathering of people looking to entertain themselves? Or do we understand that there are people even amongst us that are hurting, that are wounded, that are suffering, and some of them even in silence? Or will God say, this is the place that I have chosen to place my anointing, and these are my people that have chosen to be distributors, not only carriers of my anointing. Let me tell you something. I don't want to just be a container. I don't want to just be a box. I want to be a server of the anointing. Notice that I didn't say servant. I do want to be a servant. But how many of you know that there are some servants that are not servers? Let me repeat that. There are some servants that are not servers. Even in the history, listen to this, even in the history of slavery, and it's a horrible time of our history. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. It's a horrible time in, in, in American history, slavery. But even in the time of slavery, did you know that even amongst the slaves, there were menial jobs? And they were what they considered elegant jobs? Some people can be servants without being servants. God wants you to be a servant, but he also wants to be a server of his anointing. Don't keep it to yourself. Don't keep it to yourself. What does this mean? It means that this world is full of people. Church, listen to me. I'm going to invite a worship team to come. This world is full of people. Our city is full of people. Our community is full of people that are wounded in their spirit. And they need a church that doesn't just look good, that doesn't just sound good, that doesn't just say the right things. They need a church that legitimately has the anointing of God flowing. Flowing. Because anything that remains stagnant over time begins to sink. Smell your neighbor. You may be anointed. Listen to me. You may be anointed. But if the anointing hasn't been flowing through you, you can begin to stink. If the anointing does not flow through the church of Jesus Christ, the church can begin to stink. And it stinks before the nostrils of the community that surrounds it. It smells before the city that the church is embedded in. Because the community and the city say, huh, they talk a lot of talk, but they don't really do anything. They say the right thing. They don't really serve anybody. They talk about healing, but no one's ever healed. They always use this word deliverance, but I ain't never seen anybody delivered of anything. Can I, can I tell you something? Last Sunday, uh, because I want you to, to rest assured that the anointing of God is here. Last Sunday, there was a 12-year-old boy that came in a wheelchair. He was prayed for here. Last Sunday afternoon, Sunday night, he got up out of the wheelchair and started walking. The anointing is here. The anointing is here. The anointing is here. He had severe pain. This was the testimony that came back. He had severe pain all over his body. They, to, they, they, they showed me, they, they gave me the list of all the diseases and sicknesses that he had been diagnosed with. By Tuesday night, the report came to me that the pain had left. He had one lingering pain left in the, in the, in the small of his back. And he himself at this point was saying, well, if God healed everything else, he surely is going to heal this. The anointing is here. The anointing is here. It's up to us. It's up to us to determine whether we will be distributors, servers of the anointing. You see, our community, our city is full of people hurting in their spirit, wounded in their spirit, in despair. Some of them cannot even articulate with their mouth what they're going through because they don't understand it themselves. How do you, how do you explain? Listen, just think about this. How do you explain to somebody your spirit? I can express to you my ear. I can explain and describe my ear. I can express and explain to you my, my, my fingers and my hands. I can even explain to you my elbow, even though sometimes it's hard to see it. But I can't describe my spirit. I've never seen it. I've never touched it. But I know when it's wounded. 
And sometimes the words cannot adequately describe or define or articulate the wounding of a spirit. Sometimes the only thing that articulates it are tears streaming down your face. Sometimes the only thing that articulates it is a yell like this. Ah! Because there are no words to describe or to define or to articulate what's happening in the spirit. But rest assured that when tears flow from your eyes, God interprets what your spirit is saying. When moans and groans come from the depths of who you are and you don't even know what they mean, God knows how to interpret them. And he's placed you here today amongst his people, his church, carriers and distributors of his anointing so that you don't have to leave today with that same wound of your spirit. And so that you may be healed. Would you stand right there where you are?